Thank you. So there's this great TED talk by Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett, and she starts with this slide. And if you haven't done this before, you're probably looking at this and seeing a bunch of black and white blobs, right? How many of you are seeing a bunch of black and white blobs? What's happening right now is something called experiential blindness. You don't have a context for what you're looking at, and so it just looks like a bunch of black and white blobs. But what do you see now? A snake. Now, unless you're my two and a half year old daughter, this is not the highlight of the presentation, but I think the next part is actually pretty cool. How many of you still see the snake? Raise your hand. So I cured you of your experiential blindness. This happens all the time, right? We hear about something for the first time, then we start to see it everywhere. So what does this have to do with fundraising? So now you're seeing 70, 70 plus little boxes on the screen. What if I told you this is the amount of parking tickets that I had gotten in the last year? Would you think that was a lot? How many people would be like, that's a lot, right? You probably wouldn't let me park your car. But what if I told you it was as many days as you had to raise $10 million? Did it start to look a lot smaller? You want some more boxes? Yeah. So a lot of the time we look at data and we say that it's objective. There's an objective number of boxes up on this screen. But the context around which we see those boxes fundamentally changes how we feel about them. And how we feel about them completely changes the way we show up and take action following them. So today, we're going to be talking about five different strategies that are probably different than most fundraising strategies you've ever heard before, because they're about how you can show up to fundraising as an embodied, emboldened leader and feel fundamentally differently, because that's what's going to allow you to actually raise more from the right funders. So it's nice to meet you. My name is Mallory Erickson. She, um, I got that great introduction before. Thank you so much. And I want to tell you a little bit about my story. So probably like so many of you in the room, I became an accidental fundraiser, right? You start getting promoted up through nonprofit. All of a sudden, I found myself in a managing director role and then an executive director role, and I absolutely hated fundraising. If you had asked me my least favorite part of my job when I was an executive director, I would have said fundraising. And I was convinced, actually, that I was a really bad fundraiser because I was like, there's no way that good fundraisers want to throw up before every major donor meeting, right? Like, there's just no way. <laughs> and so I got to this moment in my career where I was like, maybe I need to leave the nonprofit sector. I can't figure out how to make this feel natural for me. And I have this feeling that everybody else knows something that I don't know, that there's some secret under the rug that I just can't learn. I loved that Jeff started off talking about the perfectionism that we often feel like we have to perform inside this sector, because that was so my reality. That impact report buttoned up version of everything running really smoothly, but the reality was I was hustling 12 to 15 hour days. My health was suffering. My relationships were suffering. I didn't have a donor pipeline that I trusted. And I was like, all right, I got to go. But what I did instead was that I got executive coach certified. And it just happened to coincide with getting trained in habit and behavior design with the scientist down at Stanford, Dr. Dr. BJ Fogg. I started working with folks at IDEO on design thinking. And those three frameworks actually came together to allow me to take a step back and say, actually, I think that there is a way for us to fundamentally show up differently as fundraisers. But it's not buried in a 15-page fundraising strategy. So that was actually what created the Power Partners formula first for me. And then it was started to be what I rolled out with clients. And now it's my signature course. So the first strategy is that you need to be aware of your thoughts and beliefs 
related to fundraising. So what does this mean, right? Like, how do you feel about fundraising? In 13 years, nobody ever asked me that question. Nobody ever said, hey, if you feel nervous walking into a major donor meeting, that is totally normal. That makes perfect sense. Nobody. So you, the very first thing is to start to be aware about your own feelings. Notice them when they come up. And then to recognize that what informs our feelings are our thoughts and our beliefs. Our thoughts and beliefs determine how we feel and then ultimately how we show up. This is the core of coaching. You've actually heard other speakers today talk about this concept sort of in different ways, actually, or highlight some of the learnings from this concept. So why does this matter? This matters because fundraising is not stressful. I know, everyone's eyes just got real big and they're like, peace out, you don't understand us actually. But hold on for one second, because fundraising actually is just fundraising. What's stressful are the thoughts and the beliefs that we hold about fundraising. I don't have enough donors in my CRM system to hit that fundraising goal. We haven't made enough progress towards that campaign goal. We're never going to make it. That donor didn't give at the end of the year last year. If we don't get a donation like that this year, our board's going to be so disappointed. That donor hasn't written back to me in 72 hours. They hate me. I made a huge mistake at the last meeting. They're never going to talk to me again, and I'm definitely getting fired. <laughs> Anyone have, have ever had one of those thoughts, maybe? Yeah. Just like this second when I said it. OK, I'm sorry. I'll make it better. I promise. <laughs> but think about that for a second. Those are just thoughts and beliefs, right? But they inform how we feel. And the way that they impact then how we show up is think about it. If you have that story, 72 hours has passed, you haven't heard back from that donor, you've made up a story that you made some mistake at that meeting, or you made some mistake in that email that you sent, you asked for a meeting too close to their last gift. How many donors are you going to reach out to today if you're holding that belief? I have a feeling it's going to be like zero. But if your thought or your belief is something like, yeah, people are busy. Jan has three young kids, and it's Tuesday. I'm probably not going to hear back from her for a while, right? Like, it takes people some time to get back. I'm probably not her number one priority, and that's OK. If that's your thought and belief, you are so much more likely to be taking the actions that you need to take to move your fundraising forward. So the very first thing here is just having that awareness. Anytime you feel that rumble in your belly, that tightness in your chest, you, don't, you're, you watch yourself procrastinating, sending out that email. What's the thought? What's the belief? Like what Mark Miller talked about, curiosity is a superpower here. Get curious. When I started to do this for myself, and I really asked myself, OK, like, what are the thoughts and beliefs that I hold about money and value and worth and philanthropy and all these things? What do I believe about fundraising? I was like, OK, I believe fundraising is like begging someone to give me their hard-earned money that they don't want to give me. Like, that was the truth that came out of me. And I got curious. I'm like, is that what I really believe? Is that what I really believe? that that's why people invest in organizations, and it wasn't. At the end of the day, what I really believe is that great fundraising is not an ask. It's an offer. It's an invitation. It's an opportunity for partnership, for collaboration. I don't use terms like this is for charity. This is to solve a problem that we both want to see solved. And with that set of beliefs, fundraising starts to shift. This is mine. I mean, you can take it. Please take it. But I just mean, like, you have to go on your own journey of what are your beliefs. And then deep down, what do you really believe? So that's just number one. I need to take some, a sip of some water. Number two is to identify your organization's assets. So. When I started to do this work with folks, I realized that so many of the thoughts and beliefs that we hold are because of scarcity mindset. How many people have heard the term scarcity mindset? How many people have been told when they feel a sense of scarcity to just be, feel abundant? Just feel abundant, right? Manifest abundance. 
And I was like, man, when you are stuck in scarcity, abundance is 45 miles away. So what's in between scarcity and abundance? Assets. Assets. Your organization's assets, beyond your programs and your services. Your assets live in every part of your organization. They're the thought leaders on your board of directors. They're your community, your audience, the skills of your staff members. You have so much that you are giving and offering, inviting people to be a part of. Yeah, take a photo of this, brainstorm your assets with your team. These are just categories of assets, they're endless. But once you start to see everything that you're offering, you start to really be able to embody that, yeah, fundraising is not begging someone to give you something they don't want to give you. They are getting so much from the engagement. And what we know more than anything that isn't even on here, I don't think, is that identity is the number one core human need. More than oxygen, more than water, more than food. When people lose a sense of identity, within 20 seconds, they start to freak out. What gives people a sense of identity? Where they belong, where they give to, where they show up for, who's around them. You're giving them that. You're a part of people building their own identity. What a gift. What an opportunity. So know your assets. Know all the different things that you're giving them. Number three is to focus on alignment before money. But do not get this twisted. This does not mean don't talk about money. Money is not bad. You don't want to bury the lead about the money. Everybody knows you guys when we're like, I just want to go on a listening tour to like hear about why you care about our organization. Everybody knows. <laughs> Everybody knows. It's okay to be transparent. Yeah, my hope is that because we want to achieve this goal together, you are going to want to invest in this the way I invest in this. We all have different assets. Our assets as an organization are X, Y, and Z. One of your assets, funder, might be your money. It's not my asset, but luckily that's one of your assets. So is there an opportunity for us to bring our assets together to solve this problem that we both want to see solved? But that starts by focusing on alignment. So what's alignment? This has also been talked about a little bit today. Kirk, I think you kind of referenced this idea in your presentation. I was like cheering in the back. This idea of seeing your organization through funders' eyes. I call these funder lenses. How does a what does the foundation see when they look at your organization? What does the corporate partner see when they look at your organization? What assets might be popping out to them? What about an individual? And individuals are so diverse. What are different groups of individuals that really identify, have their identity in your organization? We have to activate empathy to build alignment. And I think sometimes in the nonprofit sector, we're like, we're the most empathetic people. But we're often not that empathetic with our funders. We don't sit in their seats. We don't look at our organization through their eyes. And we miss huge opportunities because of that. Seth Godin, the marketing guru, has this great quote. And this is like the headline above my desk. People like us do things like this. Anytime somebody is deciding what to buy, where to go, who to, what to, you know, wear, there I say that, who to give to, they're deciding, do people like me do things like this? They're trying to understand if their identity, if their belonging is with you. And in order for them to do that, you have to be able to start with alignment. If it's just about money, that's not their whole identity, that they have money, right? Like, we've all heard it. Like, okay, who on your board of directors, like, knows people with money? Who's going to open their Rolodex to people with money? Money is not the only thing of value, and we have gotten it backwards that it is. And that's what sets up these really uncomfortable power dynamics at that table, because we have one asset in mind, money. But you are filled with assets, and so are they. And you can only find that by really identifying where the alignment lives. 
So I'm going to give you an example. And because I know I don't have a lot of time, and I forgot to, oh my gosh, you guys have a timer for me. I forgot. Um, <laughs> so nice. Um, and I just want to give you an example of how differently an alignment outreach sounds than what we typically see organizations send. An email that's focused on alignment sounds something like this. Hi, James. I was so inspired recently to see the article, article about blank, blank, blank. I was really moved by your commitment to X, and I can see that you understand deeply that our community needs blank and blank. Over here at Blank Organization, we are fiercely committed to that too. And I think there might be an opportunity for us to come together and achieve our shared goals. Would you be open to a quick conversation about what that might look like and if there is alignment there? Right? That was off the cuff, you guys. There's a much better one at that link. Um, <laughs> but right, normally what people get are emails that are like, hi, my name's Mallory Bressler, and I am the executive director of, you know, da-da-da organization. Here's my mission statement. Here are impact results, and we need money. Which email do you want to respond to? Number four, because i got to move. I want to make sure I have time for questions. So as I said at the beginning, I do a lot of work around habit design and behavior design. So the reality is fundraising feels scary. That makes total sense, you guys. It's very vulnerable. Talking about money is very vulnerable, highly stigmatized in our society. OK, it makes sense that it's scary. And so we need to design for that. Right? We need to acknowledge our emotions, feel our feelings, validate our feelings, and then we need to design to continue to get over the action line, to continue to click send on that email even when we're scared. I tell my clients all the time, I'm like, I don't need you to be, be fearless. I need you to have moments of fearlessness in the day. I need you to close your eyes and click send. <laughs> That's all I need. Right? We wait for this moment when we're ready, when we're so fearless, when we're so confident. I was so scared walking up here. My legs were shaking. That's normal. It doesn't mean we're in the wrong place. It doesn't mean we're doing the wrong thing. It doesn't mean we're bad. It means we're human beings. So here are two strategies to help you get over that action line even when you're scared. This is how I felt as a fundraiser. Super scattered. Super scattered. There are two things that are keeping us, well, actually, there's many things that are keeping us scattered, but I'm going to focus on two of them because I only have 40 minutes. One is that we spend way too much time prospecting because we're like, I'm, I'm in fundraising mode when I'm prospecting. And then we have 72 Excel sheets with different lists of donors. <laughs> you got it, right? Yeah, we got it. Right? I'm not alone here. I know I'm not alone here. So we spend too much time prospecting. And we waste a lot of time context switching. I'll explain that in a second. Here's how we solve for prospecting. If you are inside my program, we have something called Five and Dive. You are not allowed to prospect more than five funders at any time before you outreach. Five funders at a time, click send on those emails, then you can you know, have some more fun with your Excel list. Five and Dive. Number two. So context switching is all the like brain calories that we lose in between when we switch from one task to another. The problem is, is that inside the nonprofit sector, a lot of times we have been told that we can just bucket our time kind of like by fundraising activity, by program. But what happens inside fundraising is that because you have so many different types of activities, you actually are still dealing with a lot of context switching, planning that event, writing a sponsorship deck for a different program, working on a grant, meeting with a donor, that's all still context switching. So in order to optimize your fundraising time, I have my folks bucket their time. And then inside that time, it's bucketed by the type of funder, so corporate, foundation, or individual, by the program interest area, and by assets, if that makes sense for that, for that moment. So that would be like during this block of time, I'm only going to reach out to potential corporate partners who are interested in our seventh grade math program and are really aligned with X, Y, and Z. 
that is gonna really optimize like your brain space, right? Like when you're in that, you're gonna feel in flow because you are really thinking your lens is on one funder. You're thinking about really specific assets. You're gonna like find yourself in the zone and a lot less waste um, in context switching. Okay, number five. I'm sorry, does anyone else get so thirsty? I feel like I wasn't watching other speakers drink water. I was like, oh man, it's not gonna be me. Um, <laughs> how do they do that? Um, okay. <laughs> Number five is build no like trust through transparency and integrity. So I'm gonna, yeah, I'll come back to that. So I feel like I had someone say to me a few years ago when I was coaching them, you know, when I fundraise, I feel like a used car salesperson. And I really sat with that. And I was like, why do car salespeople often make us uncomfortable? Like, what is this, what is this client really saying to me right now? What do, why do car salespeople make us uncomfortable? Car salespeople make us uncomfortable because we believe they want to sell us the car, whether or not it's the right car for us. That's why we want to do all our research before we go in that room. And our donors feel the same way. They feel like we want the money whether or not it's the right investment for them. And that's what doesn't feel good. We've put money as the only asset at the table, and all money is not created equal. It is not all good for your organization. It is not all good for your staff. And so if we want to actually break out of that and find our power partners, we also need to know when to say, you know what? I so appreciate you sharing your hopes and dreams with this community with me. It actually isn't where we're focused right now. And I would love to introduce you to another organization that's more focused on that. That's not just good for your organization, that's good for the sector. And one thing, this is not one of my slides, but I just want to say, like, we are all stewarding each other's donors, too. And the more integrity that we bring to our relationships with funders, really the better it is for everyone, even when it means letting them go. It builds trust with the sector, and that, if we could all commit to that together, it would have such a huge impact. So, okay, if you're not the car salesperson, then who are you? So when I focus on no like trust, these are the pieces I focus on. That you're letting them know you by sharing real stories and real people. And the real people might be you, right? Like sometimes it's not appropriate to share real stories of the beneficiaries of your organization. So don't do that. <laughs> but maybe the real people are you, right? They're gonna like you by a level of vulnerability and respecting the relationship, like not bearing the lead about money, by valuing them for more than one of their assets. And then they're gonna trust you when you share challenges and even mistakes. I'll tell you, if you look at the Plywood Impact Report, Jeff's letter at the beginning is one of my favorite letters I've ever read in an impact report. Like paragraph three is like, we haven't gotten everything right. And I was like, yes. There's a lot of data, Adam Grant has come out with a lot of data around how when people share mistakes, it builds trust. Like we know this to be scientifically true, but we get really caught up in our perfectionism tendencies, which are not our fault. They are part of the nonprofit industrial complex capitalism, the system that we live in, right? It's not our fault that we feel those ways, but we have the opportunity to shift out of them too. And I think we saw, actually one thing I wanna say about this trust piece is like, we are always saying like, we want our donors to trust us. We just, we want our donors to trust us, but we don't trust them. We don't trust them to come along for the ride. We don't trust them to hear about a challenge and stick with it. And so part of building that trust is giving them the opportunity, is trusting them to be a part of this with us really. And here's what I want to say. If you're reading this and you're like, ooh, Mallory, this feels very far away from how my organization operates, then I want to give you the idea of a one-degree shift. 
So a lot of times we think when we hear things like this, oh man, we gotta do a 180 pivot or nothing. No. How can you be one degree more transparent with your funders? How could you be one degree more transparent with one funder? Change happens from one degree shifts. So it is definitely not an all or nothing game. Pick the thing that is like speaking to you, that gave you a little bit of chills, that you're like, that feels super true for me, and ask yourself, what is the one degree shift? Okay, quick recap and then questions. This all started with bringing awareness to the way that cognitive behavior loop shows up for you as a fundraiser. Identifying your organizational assets, that's gonna be one of the things that really helps you with that thought and belief work. It's gonna help you build more confidence in your organization. It's gonna help the way you show up at the table with funders. Focus on alignment first. And I know that feels scary. Like I know it feels scary to focus on some of those things first, right? Because you're not, but you're not hiding the money piece but you wanna make sure you're aligned. You wanna make sure that these are actually power partners. That's how you create sustainable and reliable revenue and get off that hamster wheel, right? You can run on a fundraising hamster wheel for a very long time on favor and guilt gifts, but it does not feel good. It does not feel good and it's not where big growth comes from. Make sure that your fundraising time is really optimized to help you get over the action line, to know that it's gonna be scary, to know that that's okay, that it's scary, but to really design your time for it. And then to focus on building no like trust through transparency and integrity and figuring out what that looks like for you, what that looks like for your organization, what are the one degree shifts that are available to you. These are, I'm always bad at like saying where I exist. So the best way if you want to connect with me is on Instagram. That's like the one social media channel I've kind of figured out. Um, and I also host a podcast called What the Fundraising. Um, and we bring on a lot of scientists, actually a lot of people who are not normally in the fundraising space to look at how does the science of motivation relate to fundraising? How do, how do like we have Lisa Feldman Barrett who wrote How Emotions Are Made on the podcast. So if you like some of this like out of the normal fundraising thinking, that's the best place um, to find that too. Okay, questions. And thank you for having me and for spending this time with me. Hi. So um, fundraising or just asking for money, period, isn't easy, as you, as you said. But you get used to the no's, right? So you get the first no and you're like, well, maybe, blah, 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 and, you get, and you bypass that, mm -hmm. right? And then you get the second no and you're like, but you know, maybe we can do this or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And you know the alignment is there, mm. right? How would you move past the second no or what is your gauge when you're mm. engaging with someone you know because everyone has like you know mm. you have a moral compass where you're like ah go right you know yeah how do you gauge your yeah. uh, you know yeah so i'll give you a few different things one is inside power partners we do something called a seven day no challenge and i would encourage you to do this with your teams we try and see how many no's we can get in seven days and they get points for them and we celebrate them. Yeah, we have fun. So part of the, part of the challenge is that we, cel we only celebrate the money too. We don't celebrate the scary action. We don't celebrate the fact that we were brave. We don't celebrate the fact that we picked up the phone and did a hard thing. We should be. So part of what shifts it is, is starting to, you know, I tell my organizations all the time, I'm like, don't tell me what you care about. Like, don't tell me you care about your fundraisers. Show me what you track. If all you track is the money coming in the door, that isn't, they're not gonna feel good on a daily basis because there is a lot of no. There is a lot of rejection. It's a numbers game, right? But that's the other part of five and dive. Move on, right? Okay, five more, five more, five more. I, we keep a hot 100 list. If somebody doesn't get back to you in three emails, drop them off the list, put some new people up there, right? It's okay. 
it's okay. We don't want to be for everyone. If you're for everyone, you're for no one, right? So I think part of it is the mind frame around, like when a donor would email me back and be like, I'm not interested in supporting your, your organization, I would write back and be like, thank you so much for your clarity. Like, really, thank you, what a gift. Like, thank you for saving me the time. You know, a no is not bad. Like, if a no is bad, it's because we don't value our time in chasing after a maybe. So I think that, that piece can like track it, celebrate it, put tallies up on your board. And then I think, but I, but I do think, I wanna go back to what I said before around like acknowledge and validate that it hurts. Like rejection hurts. We all, we, we all have those things, am I good enough? Am I doing the right thing? Is my cause good enough, right? Like we care so deeply about our organizations. We want everyone to care about what we care about. And that's what I used to say sometimes too, would not be to sort of like fight the, like how do I convince this donor? I just feel like, man, I wish they cared about this the way I did. It's a bummer. I hope they figure out what they really care about. And then you can always ask the donor, hey, like I see a lot of alignment here, but maybe I miss something. So would you tell me what you don't feel like is aligned? Just so I know, if I know it's like a not now or not ever, or if there is an opportunity in the future for us to have another conversation, do you, would it help if we were an older organization? Would it help, like, just to try to get some clarity, I think can be really nice and soothing with some of the feelings we have too. Yeah. Hi, first of all, thank you for just your transparency. I felt like you were reading out of my journal there. <laughs> <laughs> It's my journal too. <laughs> yeah. So, Carisha Moore with Usher's New Look. I would say, you know, we've always had, I wouldn't even call it development department, right? We've had a development person mm. and then the CEO, which I am actively now. What would you say are sort of the top three things, if you will, that you should do as it relates to fundraiser when you are small and you can't do all the things? Like, I'm on a board for uh, my university, my alumni association, and I'm like, that's a machine, they have mm -hmm. everything covered. So what do you do when it's just two people sort of working on fundraising? Mm. Okay, so it's called a funder map. Asset map out, ev all of your assets. And then really try to get into the funder lens for corporate, and I would parse out corporate to be like corporate social responsibility, marketing, corporate foundation, foundations, and individuals. Granted, this like my 12-month course is on this, so I'm giving you like the fast, the fast thing. But map out all your assets, identify what your organization sort of looks like through those funder lenses, and which of your assets you think they'd be the most excited about. You can do this in an Excel doc or up on a big board, and then and start to draw lines. This type of funder, we have the most assets for this type of funder related to this program. There's a lot of heat there. We have a lot of assets related to this type of funder around this program. There's a lot of heat there. And then prospect five at a time and outreach and test it. Five at a time, outreach and test it. Get feedback, let it be a living organism. Start to see where that is. And then I think like the more you can concentrate at the beginning, this is the question I get the most. What's the lowest hanging fruit for our organization? It's why I finally made the course because I was like, I don't, I can't answer that so fast. But I think if you can see where the most lines exist, it helps you know where to focus first. Is that helpful? Yeah. Hello. Um, I love how you've branded yourself in this space. I think that's really unique, so I just wanted to say oh, that. Also, um, what's a good tactic in order to get some of your team members on board with mm -hmm. fundraising and development? I feel like it's very much a team effort. It's social media, it's the program participants, it's everyone. So what would you say is the best way to do that? Okay, that's such a good question. And I think it's a really hard thing that kind of goes unacknowledged in our space is even the way that sometimes fundraisers are treated inside an organization, right? Like I had marketing people all the time be like, oh, like I could never ask people for money. And you're like, that doesn't feel good. And like, that's what I do every day, um, right? So I think there are a few things I do with groups that are, that are helpful. One is giving people the space to talk about their discomfort, to like normalize it. 
right? And to, and to recognize that like a lot of the beliefs we hold about money and value and worth, like that's coming from pop culture, right? Like we see all these little clips and shows all the time about the overhead myth, right? Like all the stuff that per continues to perpetuate a lot of things that are really harmful for this sector. So I think one, just like kind of naming that and saying it and saying, if you feel uncomfortable, like that's okay, that makes sense. Like giving people the, the space to feel their feelings. And then I think setting some group norms about how you talk about fundraising as an organization is really important. Like when I run meetings, I sort of say like, we don't speak negatively about fundraising here. We don't speak negatively about money here. Like let's put our belief, like our true beliefs, not our like auto response activated beliefs about money, but what do we, what do we truly believe? Like money, the movement of money into our organization does. Like when it's at its best, what is it doing? And then saying like, how do we create a space here where it feels like we're, ta we're talking about money at its highest impact all the time. And then creating a safe space, which like I'm saying this very flippantly when there's obviously tons of like organizational culture components to this, but creating a space where like you can sort of gently and um, like in partnership, hold each other accountable for the way they do talk about things. Right, so like when people are like, well, okay, I'll do that, but like not if it's an ask. It's like, remember, like we talked about, like this is a team thing and it is hard for all of us to do that. And then celebrate. In behavior change and in habit design, one of the most impactful things is this idea of shine. So celebrating the tiny things, right? So not the money, celebrate the action, celebrate the doing the brave thing, celebrate them posting that thing on social media that had a link in bio, right? But like, I know it sounds, it sound, you're like, I don't have time for all that shine, but it literally, it takes two seconds and that really does start to like, that's where we see habits change. And then to remember that habits take 21 to 90 days to become our automatic responses. So like one conversation is not gonna change everything. People need to practice, it's a muscle to build. It's contrary to the environments we've been in, the conversations we've had. So giving people the space to play, to practice, and to say like, what, do we, what would it look like if we were an organization where we were all in on fundraising? What would that look like? What would that feel like? What might that do for our community? What might be possible if we were all okay doing a little bit more towards our fundraising goals? And last thing I'll say is that everything is fundraising. Like when people are like, this is marketing, I'm like, Okay, it's fundraising, right? Or people will come to me Q2 and they'll be like, I haven't fundraised in three months. I'm like, have you thanked donors? Have you had meetings? Have you told stories? You've been fundraising. So like helping to sort of define a little bit too, fundraising is not just the moment the money moves into your organization and defining like what does it actually look like to build community with your, with everybody and one of those assets one type of asset of those people is money.